Thanks, James, and thank you all for coming to the second, but also the largest and greatest micromobility conference ever. Now, micromobility, it's what we do. It's what we build, it's what we advocate, and what we plan here. But is it what customers are buying? When we think about what we do, we think, of course, around the constraints of what we build. And so we define this word, this category, around this word micro, mobility, a compound word. Micro meaning, of course, small. And so we build small mobile vehicles. We build small solutions for travel. But again, is this what customers are buying? A lot of these vehicles are designed for short distances. At the last conference, I mentioned that actually the, the short distance is the most popular distance for travel. The trip distribution is skewed towards the low end. And so short mobility is what we're aiming for. But again, is this what customers are buying? I advocated a definition of micromobility around weight, less than 500 kilograms, about 100 kilogram, kilograms per passenger. So a 500 kilogram vehicle should be enough for four or five people. So lightness implies lower energy, implies more efficiency. But again, is this what people want? A lot of the definition policymakers are looking at in terms of micromobility is putting it in certain places. Does it fit in a bike lane? If so, it's micro. Does it fit in an allocation of real estate, perhaps, as how we can think about it? And so, in many ways, people also think about bike lane mobility as micromobility. But again, is this what people want? Do people want to go to certain types of lanes. And there are many also who advocate that they should be defined by speed, that there's a maximum speed, limit the scooter speed, limit the e-bike speed. In fact, make sure that that is part of the requirement for getting homologated, getting approved to operate. And these limits are already in place. But is this what customers are buying? Do they want slow mobility? I argue, no, what people want is urban mobility. They want to be able to travel in cities. Now, cities happen to have bike lanes. They're suitable for short distances. And certainly, light vehicles work well, easier to park, and so on. So urban mobility might be a better way to think about what consumers are looking for. But I want to focus on the second word in micromobility, this notion of mobility itself. It's funny how I came from the mobile world in the sense of mobile computing. And the mobile computer was an idea of freedom, that you could take the computer with you, you could travel with it, you, it was freed out of the office, freed out of the computing department. And in fact, the same thing happened to the phone. The mobile phone came out of the house, came out of the office. You didn't call a place, you called a person. That was a hugely liberating idea. So mobility came to mean, to me at least, freedom. But in social science, there are many words that are compounded with mobility. For example, upward mobility. Upward mobility came to be used in the 80s, and it's the foundation of the word yuppie, young upward mobile professional. We also heard throughout the 20th century a lot of debate about labor mobility, whether people had the freedom to switch jobs, to switch careers, to leave 
an existence dependent upon a certain salary. Labor mobility was a key foundation to freedom for society itself and classes in society. Overall, the thesis was social mobility was important, being able to rise above your rank. Mobility, therefore, came to mean freedom. So if micro means urban and mobility means freedom, then micromobility is urban freedom. And I believe that is what customers are buying. They're not buying a vehicle type, they're not buying a place to ride it or use it, they're buying the freedom to access a city, their city. And so here we are in one of the world's great cities, Berlin. But it's one of many cities. And the amazing thing about cities is that they are home to the majority of the world today. We've already passed the point where a majority of the population lives in cities. But cities have a funny thing about them. They're very fragile. They're not places where you can go and grow your own food. They, don't, they are unable to supply themselves with a lot of the basics for sustained life. If you think about most people in cities are not, are not generalists. They're specialists. They know how to do one thing well and are not able to grow food. They're not able to fix cars. Folks in the country, they tend to be rugged individualists. Folks in the cities are collaborationists. They tend to work with others. And so, historically, that has meant weakness. That has meant vulnerability. That has meant that cities were places which were subject to disease. Plagues ran through. There were places that could be easily captured militarily, that could be, would be very difficult to defend. And how is it then that the city came to be such a place of power? I think about this idea of comparative advantage. It's often applied to countries. That a country can do something better than another, and therefore, it gains an advantage. And if you think about cities, with the skill sets that are accumulated there, with the focus that gener is generated by all of these individuals that tend to focus and specialize, it creates a comparative advantage against not just other cities, but against a non-city world. So the cities have become the power centers, the cultural centers, the innovation centers. Cities have become the place where civilization itself is defined, where religion has been born. And as you're looking behind me here at all these cities, these are only a few. There are, these are some of the few country, cities that you'll probably recognize, many of them European cities. Some are North American. But there's only a few of these cities I can show you. Overall, there's over 1,870 cities with more than 300,000 people. And these cities are all growing individually. Think about it. How few cities have disappeared? Yes, there are ghost towns, but they're so rare that we almost are always fascinated by them. There might be a few more ghost towns in our future, towns that, because of change, because of mobility change, in fact, would disappear. But they're still the exception, not the rule. So, when you start to think about the application of micromobility, I encourage you to think about cities as your market. Not just the category of vehicle types, not just the category of software, but where 
And what are the obvious places to start? Cities are growing. Over 7 billion people will live in cities in the next 30, 40 years. And so, this is our world. The world of cities. The world of population centers. The world of skilled individuals. The world of early adopters. It's a growing world. And I'd like to take you through a journey through these worlds. Some of these, by the way, I've lived in. And I'd like to also dig into some of the history of cities. If we could switch to a view. This is a German um, map, and here you see Berlin. And I'm showing the population of Berlin as 3.3 million, but this is about 1950, as you can see on the upper right there. And if we zoom out, you'll see that the other cities in Berlin that are, again, of a certain size, represented with these red dots. But if I scroll through and look at the different dates, here's 1964, we can see how those cities have grown. And then we can maybe zoom out a bit and look at the whole of Europe. We can see Paris here, London, the bigger bubbles. Here's the world in 2001, and we can, of course, go to the present. And today, Berlin is three and a half million people. It's grown a lot since 1950. And so has Paris. Paris today is 10 or 11 million people. London, for example, is about nine million people. But what struck me when I started looking at this data is just how much more population there exists in some of the neighbors of Europe. So for example, the big bubble here is Istanbul, 14 and a half million people. In fact, Istanbul is the largest city in Europe. But if you look even further, slightly south of there, you see Cairo. Cairo is 20.1 million people. That is an amazing megacity, twice over, and it's just around the edge of Europe. This is Europe today, Moscow included. And if you were to look around, you'll see also some of the megacities around South Asia. And of course, you know probably about the cities in China, the cities in Japan, the cities in Southeast Asia. And of course, across the Atlantic, we have North America and South America. And I wasn't, I wasn't aware that, the, that, for example, Lima, Peru is 10 and a half million people. I was not aware, for example, that their, uh, Mexico City is over 30 million people, or will be soon. But back to Europe, and the question of where will, where will we be in 2035? This is 2019, and I'm going to just run the clock forward. This is United Nations data trying to project the future. So out to 2035. This is when we get to brought up the, the 7 billion people in the world. And where is the most populous city in the world? It's Delhi. 43 million people. More people will live in Delhi than the entire capitals, all the capitals in Europe. So one, one has to ask the question, micromobility, cities, urban freedom, how many cities, where are they? There's a hundred, as I said, 1,860 cities worldwide with a large enough population. By the way, 300,000 is the cutoff, and it turns out that one capital of Europe does not make that cut, and that's Reykjavik in Iceland. So let's switch back to the other slides. So how do we move 7 billion people in cities? 
Let me take the point of view kind of advocating for the status quo. If you look at this population, and we see here, for example, through the darker color, we see the change from today until 2050. So we're seeing, for example, here we have the current population, and this will be the population by 2050. And this change, each line here, represents one billion people. So th this is divided also into low income, medium income, and high income. And high and low, by the way, or high and medium are divided by about $1,200 a year. So it's not that much de defining this boundary. This boundary is about between $400 uh, uh, a year, so about a dollar a day. These folks are very low income. This is the middle income. And again, middle income includes places like India and China today. Now, the delta in population you see is small for the high income, very, very, very high for the middle incomes. But the current automotive population looks like this. This is as a percent of people who have cars. So the population uh, that has a car in, in, in urban markets, low income, is about 9% here, 13% here, and 60% here. So I asked the question, given the population growth that we're going to have, how many people would, would likely also have cars in the future? Now let's take this point of view that there'll be aspiration to grow here, aspiration to grow here, maybe not here. Let's assume that it flattens out in the developed world to 60%. The US, by the way, is already at 80%. So this is including um, that as well. So what if we have this future? by 2050. Well, if you multiply this penetration data by the number of people, we get to this number of cars. And by the way, this is also historic. So you see 1980, and then you see 2018, and then we see 2050. And this is 500 million cars. This is 1.5 million car, a billion cars. 1.5 billion cars Today, we're about 1.4 billion in the world, including some trucks and buses. Now, the question is this. Projecting to this is not a particularly challenging thing to do. It's not a particularly controversial thing to do. We got there by simply multiplying the aspirations of millions to get to that point. And in, in specific numbers, this means that we're going to double the number of cars in the world to about 1.5 billion, uh, oh, sorry, 1.5 additional billion cars to a total near 3 billion. And keeping in mind that between 1980 and today, we've seen a growth of about 1 billion cars. So 140% growth followed by another 100% growth. Now, this is, of course, a tragedy if it happens. It's a tragedy for the planet, it's a tragedy for the atmosphere, it's a tragedy for, for probably millions of fatalities that are going to result from these moving vehicles. But there's, what can stop it? This is the default case right now. What can stop it? And one of the issues I've been highlighting is parking. Because cars are stationary for about 96% of the time, Wherever they are, they need to be sitting and they need to have space. So a car, on average, should need between three and five parking places. But we actually give them more than that. In the United States, we give each car about eight parking places. In some cities of the United States, we give each car 30 parking places. So this room itself is the land allocated for one car in Houston. In most cities, the allocation of space to a car in the United States is about the size of a house. So I've actually been a little bit conservative in predicting that the number of parking spots necessary to, allocate, uh, to, to accommodate these cars is going to be a little bit less than we've seen historically. So an additional 10 billion parking spots will be needed. And don't forget, this is in the urban areas mostly. So that means a lot of urban real estate needs to be allocated to these vehicles. And how much land is that? So far, we've added Bangladesh as a parking lot. Since 1980 till present, it's done. 
Some of you may be thinking already, how can we fix this? How can we take it back? How can we reallocate that land back to people, back to living space? The United States has made its bargain. That land is gone. You want to drive? You drive past parking lots. But this one, turning Tunisia into a parking lot, is yet to come. It has to happen quickly. It has to happen in the next 30 years. So as a result, we would end up with Poland as a parking lot. Maybe if you add road space, maybe if you add access road and so on, we're looking at Germany as a parking lot. Now, I put this out here as an abstraction and perhaps an absurdity. Can we afford this? America did it. Will the rest of the world want to do it? Will all of these developing economies want to allocate their precious land in their megacities to storing cars? I think they won't. And in order for them to then break out of this jail of concrete, they'll have to have alternatives. And that's when we start to think about the rate of change. And I've been looking at the adoption curves now for almost a decade. And these are the speed at which technologies rise, the speed at which they go from zero adoption to 100% or near adoption. And there are many technologies that fail to make it all the way, but there are many who do. And when you see things like this, and you're starting to always ask, well, what makes one fast and what makes one slow? Why are some technologies rapidly growing and some technologies slow? And when you see also over time, and this, by the way, begins in 19, 30 here, and here's the present. And you're seeing some of these more recent technologies being faster. And the characteristic of these very fast technologies is that they're small. Phones, laptops, tablets. A lot of consumer technology nowadays is very small packages, and a lot of the slow stuff is infrastructural. And so here's the interesting opportunity for micro. If it's small and doesn't require infrastructure, it goes fast. But if it's big and requires infrastructure, it goes slow. So think about that for the car. If we were to deploy this many billion additional cars, one and a half billion additional cars, and they all need certain parking, how long will it take to build that infrastructure or the roads or the access to these cars that we need versus retrofitting micromobility onto an existing infrastructure, which is a lot, again, what these things did. Social media, for example, you see here, the smartphone, streaming, very fast adoptions on top of mobile networks, on top of fixed line networks, on top of internets, which took much less time. I mean, so, sorry, much more time. Things like the personal computer. And this is a map of these technologies seen as lifespans, divided into the birth period, the sort of the gestation period where an invention was made and then it had to be developed into a product. And after that, this yellow period when it went from 10% up to 50%, and the red period when it from 50% up to 90%, these are the S-curves represented as bars, and then the green period is post-saturation, post-90%. Post and this is two centuries. From 1820, actually, we begin this story. 1820 two centuries of progress. And what we see again is an acceleration in some technologies, but some are still very slow. The autonomous car, the electric car, are relatively slow compared to these consumer technologies we've seen before. So again, if you want to think about speed, a lot of the attributes of micromobility are, are consistent with that, and I think we're going to be able to take advantage of some of these slower technologies and build them into something else. But the interesting thing also that this discussion brought up is that micromobility is not an invention. No one stepped up and said, hey, you know, the world needs this. The world needs different urban mobility. The world was perceived to need electric mobility, it was perceived to need autonomous mobility, it was perceived to need ride hailing and other things which we did invest hundreds of billions of dollars into. What happened with micromobility is there were pieces taken off the shelf, combined into something that had resonated. And these were things like electric motors, batteries, good quality batteries like we see with, with uh, lithium-ion 
cellular technology, GPS technology, smartphone technology, which had been developed decades earlier. And as a result, you see this tremendous adoption. This is the e-bike chart that shows how quickly e-bikes in Europe have been sold. And these are sold to individuals, not to fleet users. Well, at the same time, mopeds, some of them are being replaced, but clearly this growth is beyond that of mopeds, beyond that of motorcycles being replaced. And this includes, by the way, some electric models. And here at the bottom, we have battery electric vehicles. This is e-cars. So e-bikes versus e-cars. E-cars, of course, are much more expensive, but you can see how much slower it is to get that going. And this has yet to take off in the, in the United States, by the way. And so finally, we have this idea of measuring the adoption curve of micromobility. And a year ago, or not even a year ago, 10 months ago, this was the data set. What we see here is the cumulative ramp for Uber. Uh, we see here uh, in red Lyft, their primary competitor. And then we see two micromobility ramps. One is Lime and one is Bird. And this was the data set. We, came to uh, assume now that the, th this will continue. Well, did it continue? Here's the latest data point, right in line. In fact, the gap between the speed of adoption of micro versus ride hailing, so this is on-demand, on-demand cars versus on-demand micro vehicles. It used to be 1.5 years to reach 1 million, and now it's two years gap to reach 100 million. And here we have actually the first European player here, also in line, actually a little bit faster. Grin in South America, similar story. A little bit faster the later you are. So we have proof that micromobility, at least, is starting to ramp more quickly. In fact, if you added most of these players together and said, well, what is the overall ramp of micromobility? I think we're well over 250 million rides. And how long did that take? It took less than two years. And how long did it take for, micro for, for ride hailing to reach this level? And yes, ride hailing is still, still growing, but it's growing more slowly. So car sharing is not a bad thing, but I'm pointing out that micromobility has the speed advantage. So wrapping things up, micromobility has this advantage. It's faster to grow, and it's faster to grow because it's solving a problem called urban mobility and urban freedom. And the city was not something we invented either. It's one of these assemblies that happened, one of these assemblies of people and specialists coming together and saying we're better off together than we are alone. And that's what this conference is all about as well. So if you were to say what we, our objective is here, it's to enable urban freedom because it is what customers want to buy. Thank you very much.